In this video, we're going to be walking through all the different ways you can monetize your Bubble app to help you understand all the options and decide on the best method that makes sense for your use case. There are lots of ways to monetize, and this will help simplify the decision because certain methods are only appropriate for certain types of apps. We'll be walking through all of that, and you want to get this right so you can charge your users and start generating a revenue as soon as possible. The first and probably the most popular way of generating revenue is through subscriptions. In fact, the Bubble platform itself uses subscription plans for you to access an editor and start building your application. With subscriptions, you grant users access to your app through a recurring billing model. Uh, so this is good if you know that your users will need to access your app on a consistent basis. Typically, most payment gateways will support subscription systems, and you typically have flexible models that you can use. Create custom pricing tiers where users can have more access the higher the tier or the more that they pay every billing cycle. Uh, also, custom billing cycles itself. It doesn't have to be monthly. It can be quarterly, biweekly, annually. It's up to you to set that up. The subscription approach is great if you're building private communities, tools that you know your users are going to come back to again and again, or even project management type of spaces where your users may be creating data, manipulating it, analyzing it in some way, and your app is really the home for it all. So the recurring billing cycle ensures that they always have uh, a place to come back to and work with that data. Salesforce is a really popular enterprise type of suite of tools that also works off of subscriptions, and they've got many different tiers and uh, different pricing plan options based on what you need. Application fees are another popular revenue generating model. Now, this is something where you have a transaction in your application and you will take a fee out of that transaction. You're usually seeing this in marketplaces where users are paying each other for services provided, booked appointments, reservations, uh, physical products, digital products, things like that. And you will typically take either a flat fixed fee or a percentage-based one. It's just up to you how you want to calculate it. Now, while this revenue model isn't as predictable uh, compared to, for example, subscriptions, it is one that can leave your app to be more affordable for your users. You do need a high volume of transactions to see a bigger profit, but it could make the most sense for your application, especially in a marketplace environment. This is typically where we see application fees uh, involved. Another use case for application fees is if you are automating systems that may incur additional costs, maybe different for every user, but things like file storage or generating files for your users, you know, depending on the number of files involved or the storage capacity, you could tack on an additional fee for that. Uber is a really popular platform that charges a service fee for every ride in their own marketplace. When it comes to in-app purchases, this is typically your standard online checkout. So if you have an online store, this is generally what you're going to use. Your payment gateway integration is obviously going to offer this because it's kind of like the baseline standard one-time payment checkout. Um, and usually the amount that is going to be charged is a predetermined price. Again, for online stores or even upgrades and additions that the user can tap onto their access in the application. Uh, usually this is so that you can grant free access to the app and users can kind of pay what they want uh, to purchase, whether it is a physical product that's going to be shipped to them, a digital asset, um, or again, uh, an enhancement type of upgrade to their experience in the app. Duolingo, a language learning platform, is really popular for this, and a lot of games are actually. Uh, so usually your users will um, access the application for the most part for free, and then if they want to enhance their experience with additional add-ons, premium upgrades, things like that, uh, they'll make a single one-time payment. It's a predetermined amount. It's not a percentage-based uh, charge of any kind, nor is it a subscription. Um, and they're just going through a standard online checkout form. They put in their credit card details. They'll see the amount. Um, and they'll make the payment and get immediate access uh, from there if it's a digital asset or uh, kick off some kind of a, a shipping sequence to receive a physical product. Hey, real quick, if you're finding this useful so far, then I have a free extended training that I want you to head to next. It's over at coachingnocodeapps.com forward slash workshop. And in this free extended training, you're going to learn the necessary individual steps you need to go from idea to app. You'll learn things like scoping your application properly, development methodologies, starting to use no-code tools like the Bubble platform, and you'll also get to see what other non-tech founders are building for their first app. So you can find that over at coachingnocodeapps.com forward slash workshop and head over there next after this video. The freemium model is one where you'll give your users limited access to your application's features and capabilities, 
they could stay on the free version of your application forever if they wanted. But in order to get full feature access or more premium access where they have, uh, you know, that you've raised all of the limits, uh, they will then upgrade and make a payment, either a one-time payment or enter into a subscription. This is typically common with SaaS applications and tools. Um, it's very helpful to offer a model like this where uh, you allow your users to get a taste of what they can do in the application, um, especially if the paid version is a bit higher cost. Uh, you can let them essentially play around in the app. Uh, again, the, the freemium is, is not the same as a trial. It's not like you're going to automatically upgrade them or cut off their account um, after a period of time. It's an approach where you always have a free version of the application, but then extended access you know, you lift limits, you can generate more data, for example, or get access to additional premium features that comes with the upgrade. Evernote is a really popular note taking software that works off of this model. You could use the free version of uh, their software forever to take notes, but for additional capabilities such as offline access, things like that, you'd want to upgrade from there. Google AdSense is an advertising product that is not just for traditional websites, but also great for web applications and specific ones too. This is certainly not gonna be the right approach for everybody, but if you have a high volume of traffic coming to your application, this can be an approach that you can take. So what this means is that you're displaying advertisements within the page designs of your application. So you're very much dependent on your users clicking uh, on those advertisements and you need a high volume of traffic in order to really be successful here. So this is good if you're building an application that uh, offers current events, news, blog articles, data that is constantly being refreshed, um, and for a large enough market where, again, you can bring in a lot of traffic. Uh, the benefit to this is really in your user's access. This is typically where you want to keep your app access free and you're dependent on the ads making the money for you. Affiliate marketing is another type of advertising approach that allows you to keep access to your app for free, but this is slightly more targeted. So with affiliate marketing, you have partnerships with companies typically so that you can promote their products and services through affiliate links. So your users will click through to these links and make a purchase from the partner and you would earn a commission from that sale. This is another one where it's very dependent on a high volume of traffic to really be successful because you actually need to convert those click-throughs on those links to uh, purchases. Now, uh, an example of how this could work is, let's say you have a marketplace for a specific industry. Let's say you're connecting fitness instructors with potential clients so that they can find who they wanna be coached by. And in your application, you can display uh, advertising links to relevant products like fitness equipment, um, nutritional products, things like that. And those are highly relevant to your users because they're already in you know, a, a fitness and wellness type of space. So they are more likely to be interested in clicking through to those links and making those purchases. A very common platform or a, a popular platform that is highly dependent on affiliate marketing is Ibotta. Uh, this is where they have partnerships with many, many different retailers and offer discounts and deals to their users. So whenever a user is uh, making a purchase through the Ibotta platform from another retailer, Ibotta will take a commission from that sale. And, you know, with more partnerships and again, high volume of user traffic, uh, that's how they can really generate a profitable revenue. Another approach you can take is sponsorships. Now, we usually see this with uh, applications tied to nonprofit organizations or community focused events. These are typically apps that are not necessarily a, a product for a business, but more informational. So news, sports, local events, um, film festivals are one where we see this uh, a lot. It's very popular for this. And this is so that you can keep access to the application and the information in the app free for your users. Uh, but of course, you need to be sustainable to maintain it, keep the data updated, things like that. So usually what you're going to be doing is displaying the branding for organizations that sponsor you. They may make a donation to you or uh, just pay for the advertising space. Uh, again, depending on the size of the sponsor, you may need to have more than one to really be sustainable with this model. But again, this is great for nonprofit organizations or just kind of info based type of applications uh, within communities. If your application is very data-driven, you're generating a lot of proprietary information, creating analytics, details, and generating reports, things like that, uh, you may be able to sell your data to interested parties for research purposes, marketing, advertising, consumer insights, things like that. Of course, you'll want to make sure that you adhere to all the laws and regulations around selling user data. These are typically quite strict, 
um, as it uh, relates to user uh, consent and data privacy. But a popular platform that does work with this type of approach is Google Opinion Rewards. Users will opt in to the platform to answer survey questions, and then Google will pass those on to their advertising partners so that they can improve their products. Another example just to think about in terms of a web app space is let's say that you're building a uh, music streaming platform. So users come on to the platform to play tracks. You know, they can follow and favorite their artists. Think of something like Spotify. And uh, you can track all of that uh, activity in your application and aggregate it in a way that is useful for research purposes and potential marketing campaigns for record labels and artists and producers. They can understand, you know, uh, just comparisons, who's doing well, uh, you know, what tracks get streamed the most, things like that. So th again, this is great if you are kind of in a research and analytics space for a specific industry. Um, especially if your application is one that's generating valuable data. If your users are typically businesses and companies, you can have them pay to white label their experience in your app, uh, which is often very attractive for them because it can allow them to have a more cohesive experience uh, alongside all of their other applications and tools that they're using within their enterprise. So the branding, of the interface, um, even down to the domain that the app is on. Now you'd want to take advantage of Bubble's sub app system to customize domains. Um, you get a lot of other white labeling options available to you if you use sub apps. Uh, but this is something that, uh, again, we see a lot with enterprise type of applications where we know that the users are going to be organizations rather than individuals. Um, and uh, a common platform that offers this type of feature is Jotform. Uh, Jotform is a form builder, and they have all sorts of tiers available for different use cases. But one of their highest tiers is their enterprise level, where you can really uh, customize the entire experience, the URL that the forms live on, the, the branding that they're seeing on the forms themselves. Uh, so again, if your users are organizations, this could be a very attractive upgrade for them and bring you a little bit more revenue. Finally, you can always use a combined approach. You know, every single app is going to be different. It's going to offer its unique features and capabilities. And so there may not be a one size fits all. You might need to put together a couple of these approaches that we've talked about. So here are a few examples um, in how to think about combining some things. So let's say you have a freemium approach, but your users are of various sizes. They could be individuals, small businesses, or large enterprise productions. So you can offer many different tiers of pricing levels depending on the type of user that they are. Again, whether it's an individual or a company, and they will pay to upgrade to the appropriate tier. This is just up to you know the nature of your application and who you're serving. Um, another example here is completely free access to uh, industry knowledge bases, resources, tools. Uh, that way it's an easy entry for your users. You can build up a user base very quickly, but you can also offer um, a add-on consulting uh, capabilities where you can match users with a, an industry professional, for example, to have a meeting with them. And that's just a regular checkout, one-time payment as needed type of thing, but certainly not required in order to use the rest of the application. Um, and finally, with marketplaces, we usually see all sorts of approaches to revenue models because these really can go a lot of different ways. So for example, your providers can pay to be listed in the marketplace or even just pay to be featured uh, at the top of a search result. You've probably seen that in something like Amazon, where you'll see kind of sponsored um, listings that are always at the top. Your consumers are typically going to be paying for the services or products that they're looking for, um, whether it's a, a physical product or a, a reservation of some kind. Um, and you can take an application fee out of those transactions. Other approaches we've seen to the marketplace model is subscriptions. Uh, so either the buyer and or the seller subscribe to access the application you know, and that's your model or that's your revenue generator uh, from the platform's perspective, but you allow the transaction from the buyer to the seller to, to be fully to them. You don't take anything out of that. The, the seller takes everything home from that transaction. All right, I hope this was helpful. And if it was, the content you're about to see on the next screen will help you take it even further.